Welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council's first seminar of the fall semester and our first in-person program in over a year. Thanks to everyone who has joined us in person today and thanks to also to all of you who are joining us via City Channel 4's live stream. I'm Dave Martin, president of ICFRC's board of directors and host for today's program. ICFRC thanks its members and supporters who have renewed their annual membership in ICFRC, and we invite those of you who have not yet renewed your membership or joined ICFRC to do so, please, on our website at icfrc.org. We depend on the financial support of our members and friends to enable us to continue to provide high quality international educational programs at no cost to our community, so we appreciate your membership support. ICFRC is deeply grateful to Tice Winkleblack and Midwest One Bank for their annual support for our programs, including the use of the main bank's ground floor conference room. We acknowledge and thank our organizational supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's honors program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization. We thank them for their financial support. We thank City Channel 4 for their support in live streaming all of our in-person programs this fall. And we thank City Channel 4 and the UI Digital Libraries for making all our programs available to online audiences. We are also grateful to the Iowa Arts Council for its financial support through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Iowa City Human Rights Commission. We recognize that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The area of Iowa City was within the homelands of the Iowa, Meskwaki, and Sauk, and because history is complex, time goes back far beyond memory, we also acknowledge the ancient connections of many other indigenous peoples here. The history of broken treaties and forced removal that dispossessed indigenous, indigenous peoples of their homelands was and is an act of colonization and genocide that we cannot erase. We implore the Iowa City community to commit to understanding and addressing these injustices as we work toward equity, restoration, and reparations. As we get started, I'd uh, just like to cover some in-person and live streaming etiquette tips. Following our speaker's presentations at about 1240 or so, we will have a 15, 20 minute Q&A. And for people here in the audience, you will be able to raise your hand and ask your question. And please wait for the microphone to be brought to you before asking your question. For those of you watching via City Channel 4, you can text your questions to ICFRC at 319 600 2588. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Mitchell and Ms. Yufan Yang, who will speak about climate change and conflict. Dr. Sarah Mitchell is the F. Wendell Miller Professor of Political Science here at the University of Iowa. She is the author of six books and more than 55 journal articles and book chapters. Her areas of expertise include international conflict, political methodology, and gender issues in academia. Professor Mitchell is co-founder of the Journeys in World Politics Workshop, a mentoring workshop for junior IR women. She received the ISA Quincy Wright Distinguished Scholar Award in 2015, a Distinguished Alumni Award from Iowa State University, and she has served as president of the Peace Science Society. Yufan Yang is a doctoral candidate of political science at the University of Iowa. She studies international relations and political methodology, her areas of expertise include political violence, environmental politics, and text analysis. She is the author of a journal article in Defense and Peace Economics and a book chapter in What Do We Know About War, third edition. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mitchell and Ms. Yang. Thank you for having me and you, Fawn. Uh, Yufan's on Zoom, so she'll be coming in. We're both going to do the presentation today. Okay, next slide. So what we're going to talk about in this uh, project and talk today is a couple of questions. First of all, we want to consider how do natural disasters influence the chances for war or militarized disputes between countries? 
And here, uh, Yufan's going to describe our research that was just accepted for publication two days ago, <laughs> which is great, um, in a paper uh, on disasters and interstate conflict. And then the second question that I'll be talking about is how does climate change and volatility influence the chances for inter interstate conflict? Um, and this is from some co-authored work with Cody Schmidt and Bomi Lee. And then more generally, hopefully you'll leave here today wondering uh, how, does it, how do environmental changes affect both internal and external security? Next slide. Just to give you some examples for what we're talking about here. Uh, so one of the cases that we look at in our paper is a river conflict between Bolivia and Chile that arose in 1999. And prior to that dispute, uh, Bolivia was experiencing more uh, volatility in their rainfall, meaning they had bigger flooding seasons and bigger droughts. And so what we wanna know for part of our project is if you have that kind of volatility in weather patterns or disasters, does that increase the risks for conflict? In this particular case, we did see a, a diplomatic conflict over the diversion of the Salala River. We can also see disasters being the impetus for uh, interstate conflicts. A famous case here is the Bola cyclone that hit East Pakistan in November 1970 and caused you know, over 100,000 deaths. The, the government of Pakistan had a really terrible disaster response to that situation and the conflict that arose after that was part of the impetus for the Bangladesh war between India and Pakistan. However, disasters don't always cause conflict. Uh, after a, a very large earthquake in 1999 in Turkey, the Greek government offered a lot of assistance uh, following the disaster and removed its objection to Turkey joining the European Union. So sometimes we see cooperation. This is what the people in social sciences call disaster diplomacy, the idea that you could get cooperation after disasters. Next slide. Okay, so there's a really large literature in political science and economics on how uh, disasters and climate change relate to civil wars. Uh, so most of the work that's been done on this topic has focused on conflict within countries. Uh, there's a, quite a few studies showing that climate change and climate variability as well as natural disasters increase the risks for civil wars and protests and revolutions, different types of internal conflicts. There's also a just as large of a literature that says there's no relationship between climate change, disasters, and internal conflicts. And some people have posited that maybe it's curvilinear, so maybe you get more conflict in uh, you know, situations of really big abundance or scarcity of resources. And so you could imagine uh, Hendricks and Salahian find, for example, in Africa that both floods and droughts can cause uh, larger amounts of internal protests. Next slide. However, even though there's this really large literature on uh, intrastate conflict, we know less about how uh, climate change and disasters affect conflict between countries which is kind of interesting, right? Because most of the war literature began by focusing on conflict between countries. And it was after 9-11 that there was a lot of interest that sort of turned in political science to studying terrorism and uh, intrastate conflict. Uh, some of the studies that have looked at this have found that perhaps global warming made war between countries less likely. Uh, and so the argument here is that as temperatures get hotter, it's harder to, you know, people are less likely <laughs> to mobilize, I guess, uh, for fighting. So you could actually um, get, uh, ironically, less war as global warming increases. Um, there's also a recent study by Devlin and Hendrick showing that climate volatility makes conflict between countries more likely. So if you get like I said, bigger periods of cold spells and dry spells or droughts and floods. So this sort of big deviation. 
if you think about what's happening in the United States this year, one in three people in the US has been estimated to be affected by a disaster. Uh, and so this is certainly a year where we're looking around what's happening in our country and we're thinking, wow, like a lot of people are getting affected by wildfires that seem bigger than, than normal, right, in the West. And floods and hurricanes that seem to be having bigger impacts than normal. And so uh, this is what, when I talk about volatility, I'm talking about these kind of uh, experiencing more disasters um, uh, than we might expect or more weather events. Okay, now UFON's gonna show you some data uh, that looks at the trends in both disasters and climate deviations to give you a sense of, of how it's changed over time. Okay, so here is an overview of the uh, climate change, um, especially for rainfall and temperature over the last decade, no, the last century. Uh, so the graph on the left shows the trend of rainfall and temperature. And we can see that in the past century, especially after the Second World War, um, the average temperature and rainfall have been increasing. And it's, um, it's consistent uh, with our impression of global warming. And um, the graph on the right shows the deviation, so the volatility from long-term averages, um, especially for temperature, you can see there is a lot of um, deviation from the long-term um, averages. So that means that we have more extreme weather, and we know that extreme weather can cause more natural disasters. So how do natural disasters look like? So um, this graph, this graph is showing the overall trend of natural disasters over the last, um, the past 50 years. So overall, we can see the amount of disasters have been increasing. And especially the rapid onset disasters is contributing the most of the total disasters from 1970 to 2018. Here is the map, it's a GNF. And uh, you can see it more intuitively on the trend of natural disasters from uh, 1950 to, to today. And apparently the United States, China, and India, are uh, the countries that are experiencing the most natural disasters. And they are all big countries with large popul populations, which means most of the people in the world suffering from natural disasters. And this is another world map, also a GIF, and it's showing the rapid onset disasters only and from 1950 to today. And the trend is pretty much very the same um, of the total disaster. So it means that, well, it, the rapid onset disaster take account of most of the disasters. So how do natural disasters affect international conflict? The first perspective is, uh, as Sarah mentioned before, the disaster diplomacy, that disaster decreases conflict. And some sociologists argue that um, disaster provide opportunities for um, cooperation, especially within a society, because people are suffering and they are sharing the same experiences so they can build empathy and NGOs, civil societies can provide relief and help each other. So uh, it can create a cooperation cycle. So this is the first mechanism whereby the investor can decrease conflict. And the second mechanism is indirect that after natural disasters, governments are more likely to provide um, financial aid and some post disaster management to the people, which can reduce um, their spending, the government spending on military and international war. So this is an indirect mechanism whereby disasters can decrease international conflict. And the last one is um, after international, after uh, natural disasters, um, states are more likely to provide like foreign aid and assistance to the state that is currently having disasters, and which is um, another mechanism for international cooperation and peacemaking. But we have a different perspective 
that um, disasters can actually increase international conflict. Um, our argument is based on diversionary war theory, which is a conventional international relations theory. And this theory is basically saying uh, when a country is experiencing domestic problems like civil war or economic shock, leaders are more likely to um, use a diversionary war, they're more likely to initiate interstate conflict to di divert public attention from domestic problems. And we're arguing that disasters are actually a form of domestic problem, domestic turmoil, especially when the government is responding poorly to disasters. So when it happens, the leaders are more likely to use um, international war as a strategy to divert public attention from for disaster management. And in here, we argue there are two interaction effects. One is that when the state is experiencing more other type of domestic problems, such as civil war, um, natural disaster provide more incentive and more opportunities for states to scapegoat rival state. So they are more likely to initiate in interstate conflict with their rival state to divert public attention from its domestic problem. And secondly, we're arguing that there, um, when a state has more multiple interstate rivals, um, they have a greater opportunity to use divergent force. Uh, this is because just um, interstate rivals, they are easy targets. And when a state has more interstate rival, they have more easy targets uh, to divert um, public attention from a domestic problem. Um, and here is our um, empirical evidence. So our dependent variable here is the duration between military rights and, and interstate disputes. So um, you can see uh, from here at all type of disasters and rapid on-site disasters shorten the duration between those disputes. So that means um, rapid on-site disasters, especially, it contributes to um, the, the initiation of interstate conflict between rival states. So for example, uh, our theory is basically saying if India appears when seeing a um, earthquake, and um, in India is more likely to initiate a war against a rival state, such as Pakistan and China. This is, um, this is our result for the interaction effect I just mentioned before. The graph on the left is showing the interaction effect of natural disasters and domestic conflict. So domestic conflict is a type of domestic turmoil. And this graph, the graph on the left, is showing, you can see the black solid line represents states with more disasters and more domestic conflict. So it has the lowest survival rate across time. So which means disaster divergentary behavior is more likely for those states, for the states with more disaster and more domestic conflict. And the graph on the right is showing the interaction effect um, of disasters and number of interstate rivals. So still the black solid line represents states with more disasters and more interstate rivals. And especially compared with to the gray dotted line, you can see um, the gray dotted line represents states with low disaster and no interstate rivals. So you compare these two lines, you can see um, states with more rivals have a low rate of survival across time, which means that disaster diversionary behavior is more likely if leaders have more external enemies, more um, interstate rival to target following a disaster. Okay, I will hand it over back to Sarah. Okay, so the, the second uh, set of findings I'm going to talk about is how climate change relates to conflict. So Yufan just showed that natural disasters can increase interstate conflict, especially if countries have lots of external enemies, like I mentioned India, right, uh, contesting uh, 
their borders with both China and Pakistan. Um, so in those kind of situations, uh, leaders are more likely to use force following disasters as a way of diverting the public's attention from a poor disaster response. Um, we also, in another project, looked to see how climate variability uh, influences interstate conflict. And so we look at two things here. When you guys think of global warming, you probably think of what we call climate deviation. So global warming uh, is typically measured by looking at 30 plus years of, of temperature patterns and then seeing whether the average temperatures today are, are higher than they were in the last 30 years. Um, and so uh, climate deviation implies that you get bigger deviations or you're farther away from the long run mean than you used to be. There's also though the idea of climate volatility, which as I said is in a given year is your experience of weather patterns more extreme. So in Iowa, imagine that we had a winter that had more snow than we're used to, you know, like a huge amount of snow and then in the summer, we had a drought because there was no rain for three months, right? And so that would be the idea of volatility, is that in that particular, in a particular year, Iowa would be experiencing more rainfall in the winter and less rainfall in the summer uh, compared to its long run averages. And I showed you earlier uh, in that graph, Yufan showed you that climate deviations are getting bigger in recent decades. So, your perception that weather events are getting more extreme is, is held up. When we look at the data, they are getting more extreme. And it's happening for all countries uh, all over the world. And so uh, our theory argues that climate variability makes interstate conflict more likely through two mechanisms, uh, what we call scarcity and abundance and uncertainty. OK, next slide. Uh, before I talk about those two mechanisms, I'm just going to describe here what we mean by interstate conflict. Um, in the previous paper, Yufan described, we use any militarized dispute between countries. So that's any situation where a country threatens to use their military to get something, uh, shows force, say, by moving naval vessels offshore, or uses force by firing weapons, moving troops across borders. Um, so those are all the kind of incidents that we were looking at in the previous paper, and there are over 3,500 of those incidents uh, in the world from 1816 to uh, 2010 in the data set we were using. This project looks, uh, uh, kind of takes a step back and also looks at diplomatic conflict. So when countries start a conflict verbally and say, I want that piece of land, and the other state says, no, you can't have that piece of land. And we look at three types of issues. Territorial disputes, which are sovereignty disputes over who owns land. River disputes, which are uh, issues over who has water quantity rights uh, or, or could be over pollution in a river or navigational rights along a river. And then also maritime conflicts, which involve uh, the access to or sovereignty of maritime spaces uh, or resources. I gave you some examples there. Uh, just to, to take an example from our paper, uh, we have Bolivia and Chile, which have experienced all three of these types of conflicts. So in 1848, Chile made a diplomatic claim against Bolivia over ownership of the Atacama Desert. And Bolivia did not accept Chile's claim over that area. They eventually went to war in 1879 in the War of the Pacific. And then Chile won the territory in that war. Bolivia then lost their access to the sea, which they were very upset about. So then Bolivia began a maritime conflict against Chile, arguing that they should get back that access to the sea. Bolivia and Chile have also had uh, conflicts over water rights in three different rivers uh, it, that they share. And these have to do mostly with water quantity. So one side trying to divert water from a river for irrigation, and then the other side complaining about that diversion. And so what we do is for in a data project that I've been working on with Paul Hensel for a couple of decades, it's called the Issue Correlates of War or ICAO project, we track diplomatic conflicts, and then we, we see whether or not countries use military force or peaceful means to resolve these kind of conflicts. Okay, next 
Okay, so how might climate change affect how countries contest territorial or water areas? Uh, well, first of all, we could think about uh, water, for example, as creating either scarcity or abundance of resources. In, a, in the water literature, people often think about scarcity as being dangerous. So in the Middle East, they have, right, a long-standing uh, problem with access to uh, fresh water for lots of populations. And so not surprisingly, the Middle East in our data set has some of the most frequent and most militarized river conflicts. Um, and so climate change can make this worse because climate change changes uh, rainfall patterns, right? So it, it can create more rain than, than, is no, than is normal over time or less rain. Uh, and so because it changes those precipitation patterns, it can change the economic and strategic value of those uh, territories or river areas. Um, desertification, for example, which is happening in a lot of places, is making uh, what was fertile agricultural land not viable for farming anymore. Uh, a lot of people around the world have been displaced from droughts and flooding, uh, so taking away their livelihood. And uh, climate change will bring about a lot of changes in agricultural productivity, which has significant implications for Iowa, certainly, uh, going down the road. And so internationally, this can motivate countries to contest the ownership of areas that are not experiencing this reduction in strategic value. And so we might imagine there's been a lot of threats by the Egyptian government to use force to protect their water rights in the Nile River, for example, but they have not done so yet. They have not really played the military card, but they've threatened to do that against Sudan and other states in the Nile. And so we could imagine in the future that if water scarcity is big enough that uh, Egypt might in fact use force to protect its water rights. We think that the country that's challenging the status quo and the issue uh, is more likely to be affected by climate change. So if you're a downstream state and a river basin, you don't have control over the flow of water from the upstream state. And so you're the country that's more likely to contest that. And so our first hypothesis is just that increases in climate deviations from long-term average temperatures or rainfall levels uh, should increase the potential risks for diplomatic and militarized conflicts. Next slide. I mentioned Bolivia and Chile. Uh, so prior to one of the uh, river, or two of the river disputes that we code in our data set, one is in 1921 and the other is in 1939. And in both cases, Bolivia, which is the red line there, experienced declining precipitation levels uh, compared to their long run averages. And so that's consistent with the idea that when Bolivia was experiencing water scarcity, they were more likely to press their diplomatic claims against Chile for, for those rights. Okay, next slide. But we also argue that climate change can increase uh, uncertainty about future resource stocks. And so there are all these projections going back to Egypt that Cairo could run out of water by you know, 2030, 2035. So you know, Cairo still has water today, but imagine what would happen, right, if Cairo is completely out of water and all of the agricultural areas around Cairo have no water. Uh, it's not hard to imagine then Egypt using military force to protect uh, water rights for their citizens. So as we get this uh, volatility, maritime resources as well. The warming of the oceans is causing greater acidity levels and, and so it's affecting fish populations. Those fish populations are migrating out of their current areas. And so countries have claims to fish in certain areas of the sea and those areas can change as climate change happens. And so that, that increases the salience of those areas. There's an interesting thing in international law too that as the land border from which you make a maritime claim changes, then your maritime claim changes. So if Florida, right, imagine a, a 200 mile nautical mile exclusive economic zone off the coast of Florida, if you remember in Al Gore's uh, movie, right, <laughs> Inconvenient Truth, he showed Florida being underwater, right? So, so the idea would be that the, the claims that the United States government could make off the coast would be much 
which be much smaller than they are today, right? Because the land on which those are based uh, would be would be changed. Um, and so, what we're going to test for the second hypothesis is whether a diplomatic uh, conflict is more likely when when countries experience uh, greater volatility in the the those mean temperatures or or, or precipitation. And so the idea here is that volatility creates more uncertainty about who's going to get what resources in the future. And so if I don't know exactly what I'm gonna to get tomorrow, then I'm gonna to be more likely to pursue my claims today with uh, either diplomatic means or force. Okay, so the results I'm gonna show you now are using data from our project from 1901 to 2001 in the Western Hemisphere in Europe. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the, the graph on the left there, the top line is United States average precipitation, and then the bottom line is Canada's average precipitation. And then on the bottom, the top line is US temperature, and bottom is Canada. And you can see that if we were gonna study the effect of climate variables, it's, we have to standardize them somehow, right? Because Canada is colder than the United States on average and has less precipitation on average. And so the typical way scholars deal with this is by using uh, what are called z-scores, where we take a the temperature today minus the average temperature, and then we divide by the standard deviation of that temperature. And so we basically standardize a uh, country's uh, deviation from their own averages so that you can then compare whether you know, Canada and US, what is their uh, climate situation? So that makes it comparable. And then we also, to calculate volatility, we take every, every month of temperature or, or precipitation, and then we calculate the variance in that monthly value. And then we compare the variance in a, big, in a year to the long run variance. And so like I said, if Iowa has really, really wet winter and really, really dry summer, then that's going to be a bigger variance year for Iowa's uh, climate volatility. And then we also include square terms to capture that idea that both scarcity and abundance could be conflict inducing. Okay, next slide. Okay, so our first finding is that it is true that both scarcity and abundance can increase diplomatic conflicts. Uh, so we see that on the right of this graph is where you have uh, flooding basically, and on the left is where you have uh, uh, droughts. And you can see that in both cases, the, the propensity for diplomatic conflict is higher in those circumstances. Next slide. Um, however, our findings on temperatures, they fit with the earlier research I mentioned, arguing that maybe war is getting less likely as global warming is increasing, because for the most part, increases in temperature tend to reduce the likelihood that countries begin new diplomatic conflicts. Next slide. Um, then we look to see whether uh, countries that have, so the next question is, do they militarize those conflicts? And here we find that if you have greater, um, basically flooding uh, is more likely to cause militarization than droughts, which I think is pretty interesting. <laughs> so, so at least in this data, you get more militar militarized action from, from flooding. Uh, I have an example here of uh, Venezuela had a lot of rainfall in 1998 and the year before it initiated a militarized conflict against Guyana over their territorial dispute. Next slide. So I showed you that global warming in terms of the deviation score doesn't increase diplomatic or militarized conflict risks, but when we capture that volatility, so within a given year, how volatile is temperature or, or precipitation relative to the long run variance, here we do find that volatility matters. So greater volatility uh, in temperature increases conflict risks. Uh, and so both diplomatic conflict on the left and militarized conflict of existing diplomatic issues. And so, uh, so global warming, if we just measure it as a deviation from the long run average, we might think there's no effect of global warming, but our results show that 
what we're missing from those results is it's, it's the changes, the monthly changes that are happening within countries every year that are really affecting the risks for conflict. So it's, it's, it's moving farther away from your averages in short-term periods that causes a lot of conflict. Next slide. So overall, our research shows that disasters and climate shocks increase the risks for interstate conflicts. Um, UFON also showed that climate shocks act as threat multipliers when combined with other conflict-inducing factors. So if you have disasters and you have civil wars going on and you have a dangerous neighborhood with lots of interstate rivals, then you're more likely to get uh, interstate conflict over climate issues. Precipitation, deviations, and volatility are dangerous, while temperature only seems to operate through the volatility mechanism. So I think that's kind of interesting and, and is a new uh, sort of nuance on the earlier findings. Next slide. So what are the policy implications from our work? Uh, well, first of all, any agreement to resolve land or water rights between countries has to compensate countries that are negatively affected by climate change. And so we, we have to think about how those downstream states would be affected, for example, in a, an agreement over river basins. When we, I didn't show these results, but we split our analyses into territorial maritime and river issues. And we found, this is alarming, that territorial issues are the most uh, strongly affected by climate change. Uh, why is that alarming? Because territorial disputes are the leading cause of war in history. <laughs> and so the fact that we get the strongest results for land border disputes, uh, I think that's pretty, pretty interesting and maybe a little bit alarming moving forward. Um, we should think about distributing disaster aid with respect to countries' overall climate conflict risks, um, but obviously aid could be politicized uh, in a lot of these situations. And Guatemala, after the 1976 earthquake, uh, had a lot of aid that flowed in, and the government thought that the aid agencies were helping to fund the insurgency that was going on. And so they, they engaged in massive uh, repression of the population. And so I've, I have another project with Nathan Timms, who's a student in our department. And we find that after disasters, governments are more likely to use repression uh, against their populations, especially if they are facing domestic turmoil. So it's consistent with what we're finding here. That's really depressing stuff to be reading, I have to tell you, is these countries just got hit by disasters, and then the government starts killing and doing other things to their population. Um, and then finally, uh, policymakers need to think more about volatility. So we can't just talk about global warming or changes from long-run averages. We need to start thinking about how much volatility in weather patterns our country is experiencing in each year, and, and that will help us pinpoint where conflict is more likely to break out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to our Q&A portion of the program. Uh, for those of you in the audience, you can raise your hand, and I think Catherine will pass around a microphone, uh, before, I, and then you can ask your question. For those of you watching us live, you can text questions to 319-600-2588 to ask your question. I don't know how we're going to see those. You got them, you got them there. Great. Uh, so while we wait for questions to come in, I'd like to mention again that this is ICFRC's first seminar for the spring semester. Our next program will be next Thursday evening, September 16th at 7 p.m. in the Old Capitol in collaboration with the Department of Political Science. The topic will be Gen Z and foreign policy and will feature two academic experts and two university Gen Z students. This uh, event will also be live streamed. And for a full list of our fall programs, you can visit icfrc.org. And I've got a list, those of you uh, on each chair, there's a list of our fall programs for those of you that are here in person. Uh, finally, ICFRC is grateful to be able to make its online programs free and open to the public, but we do rely on the support of members and attendees in order to operate. And if you are able to make a donation to support these programs, please go to www.icfrc.org slash donate.
So now we're going to transition to our Q&A session. So anybody, anybody's got a question? There's a hand in the back. I'm going to bring the microphone to you, and I'll hold the microphone for you. Thank you for a great presentation. I know this isn't quite in the realm of your research, but I wondered if you could make any comments about climate refugees and how that might also impact conflict. Uh, yeah, there's been uh, research looking at refugees generally on interstate conflict and civil wars and, and yeah, finding that Countries who receive more refugees are at higher risk for civil wars, for example. So uh, a lot of climate refugees are tend to be internally displaced people rather than clock. They don't cross boundaries as much as, say, war refugees do. Um, so that's that's one difference, perhaps. Um, but um, Elise Pitsy and I are working on a project uh, coding how governments respond to disasters, and a lot of that has to do with uh, when people are displaced internally, how does the government address, you know, help those populations get relocated or rebuild? Um, and so, yeah, we're we're starting a new data collection project looking at those government policy responses in more detail. Yufan, did you want to add something there? Um, no. <laughs> that answered it perfectly. <laughs> Okay, you can take the next question. Ed, I, I'm going to hold the thanks. Oh. I'm going to stand up. Question. Uh, yeah, you've spoken about um, how climate change can uh, influence the happening of conflicts and war. Um, uh, is there research, and what are your thoughts on the influence of war? and of military spending and military activity on climate change. Yufan, do you want to take the first answer? Yeah, so there is, um, there, there are a lot of um, literature on this topic too. So um, basically, war and um, later spending and all the other human activities um, contribute negatively to the climate change trend that human activities can greatly increase um, global warming and um, other natural disasters. So um, academically, uh, it causes some difficulty in the analysis, but I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, um, but I do, I do think that um, human activities, especially war, can can lead to um, global warming, especially the post-war uh, reconstruction. Yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, and there's also, I mean, there's specific examples of war destroying, you know, animal populations or. Sometimes uh, after World War II, there was like recovery of fishery populations because uh, there were fewer uh, people, you know, people were diverted from fishing to fighting. So yeah, there has been some uh, literature linking resources like fisheries and conflict and showing that conflict has a feedback effect on, on some of those uh, renewable resources. Um, in terms of things like you know, does war affect earthquakes? Probably not. I mean, I, I'd be shocked if that was true. Um, although maybe if fracking could cause earthquakes, uh, you know, maybe I'm missing something, you know, some kind of uh, effect. Um, but I think, uh, so some types of those, uh, some types of those patterns like earthquakes are probably not being driven by human activity as much as say flooding and other act, you know, things like floods are affected by pre-existing uh, infrastructure and that, that certainly is affected by human activity. So that, that's why some people don't like the term natural disaster because they think disasters are endogenous to human activity. So, so they don't like the word natural uh, in front of that. So we have a question from one of our um, people watching on live stream. Are there any patterns in your data regarding differences by world and region, by world region? So in the climate change paper, we did split our data between Europe and the Western Hemisphere, and we found that 
the patterns were stronger for conflict in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so there wasn't as much conflict in Europe over climate factors, but our data only goes back to 1901. So that's kind of missing a very large period of European conflict <laughs> that happened uh, before that. Um, I don't remember, Yifan, did we separate our disaster analyses by region? No. I don't think we've done that, but that's a great idea. <laughs> To, I, bet to this is, I bet this is from one of our political scientists. I don't know, but I bet this is from a political scientist. Any other questions in the room? Because I've got one more question here. So question, another question I've gotten from someone in live streaming is, um, given what you've said today, this seems to be another huge argument for why we need to deal with global climate change now. So are you having any impact with policymakers? Are they aware of all your work? Uh, not yet, I guess so. <laughs> Um, I mean, I've, I've only started working on, the, on these issues in the last three or four years, so. But yeah, obviously, uh, we'll, we'll start writing, once we get enough accumulated findings, and we'll start writing uh, blog pieces and other things for general audiences. Um, but we're, we're kind of in the, the front end of the project, so. I prefer to have, as a scholar, to have a little more evidence before I make assertive policy prescriptions. But. Thank you. Any qu other questions here or online? <laughs> okay. Last chance. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to conclude our program now, and uh, we've already done that. I want to give another big thank you to Dr. Mitchell and Ms. Yang for their presentations today and for sharing their expertise with us today. And Sarah, I'm honored to present you with our highly coveted ICFRC coffee mug for tea, uh, coffee, or the beverage of your choice. And Yufan will uh, present this mug to you digitally, and then we'll make arrangements to get it to you in person, okay? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.